everybody. I also want to thank Fred Bottom from the Korea Society and everybody else who's volunteered tonight. I also want to thank Jennifer Bennett Yan and the staff of the Asian American Film Lab. Welcome. I, don't, I see a lot of new faces here, which gives me another chance to talk about the Unfinished Work Program. Um, we're looking for projects that are works in progress, be they documentaries, be they video performances, be they screenplays, and in this case tonight, TV pilots. It's a wonderful opportunity for filmmakers to see their works performed in the case of scripts by wonderful actors from our actors directory. Um, and you can submit anything from a scene that you're struggling with or an entire screenplay that you're struggling with. Because in my mind, everything is a work in progress until the director says roll, but then when they say cut, you're rewriting it in your head anyway. <laughs> so tonight we have two wonderfully contrasting projects. We have Will and Lee's TV pilot called Nick of Time, and he's going to present it with our wonderful cast, and then he and I are going to sit and talk with you for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to show some extraordinary footage from Savannah Washington's documentary playing Frisbee in North Korea. Yeah, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to thank the Asian American Film Lab and also Korea Society for having us have this event here. Um, it's an honor and it's a privilege. And it's like uh, having your work be heard is actually an amazing experience. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask all my wonderful actors uh, to come up and sit at their seats so we can get started. Um, um, I thought about maybe doing an introduction, but I was like, no, I mean, we'll just, we'll just read it. <laughs> we'll just go. You know, let you guys experience it and then let us know. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'll introduce these one of my actors. Um, <laughs> oh, that, that will help. This is Grand Powell, Erwin Falcon, Jennifer Anthony, most of you know her. Uh, that's Austin Koo, uh, John Wu, Mallory Wu, no relation by it, <laughs> as far as I know. And then that's uh, um, Maki Borden. Borden, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Maki Borden. So, um, uh, send them your ears. Thank you. Interior Locker Room Day, titled January 11, 1991. Adolescent boys in wrestling singlets weigh in. Slouching, moppy haired Nicholas Nicky Sloan, 11, steps up. Weights shift on the scale. It settles on 93 pounds. Nicky blows a tuft of hair out of his eyes and catches the cascading disappointment of Coach Wolf, 40s, donning a green USMC cap with sergeant stripes. Say it with me, Sloan. 90 pounds. 90 pounds. Say it like you mean it. 90 pounds, sir. <laughs> Note, narrator, a David Attenborough-esque expert, speaks as if presenting a nature documentary. <laughs> Young Nicholas Sloan learned many cruel truths about life. If you can't get there on your own, this will. Coach hands him a bottle of liquid laxative. Nikki reads it. <laughs> One, life doesn't come with a warning label. Interior gymnasium, evening. Froomp. A sweaty shoulder pummels into Nikki's gut. Nikki's stomach churns, grumbling. His adversary maneuvers for the takedown. Splat. Nikki hits the mat as his opponent towers over him. The boy's victorious sneer turns to repulsion. The crowd lurches, disgusted. <laughs> Amongst the horrified faces, Nikki's friends, teammates, the whole school. Two, contrary to popular wisdom, nobody really wants to see who you are on the inside. <laughs> Nikki lays on the mat within a sea of human excrement. <laughs> Interior hallway, next day. Ashamed, Nikki averts his eyes and plows ahead. Students laugh. He reaches his locker, spray-painted, shit boy. He buries his head inside, then, interior high school three years later. Closing his locker, 14-year-old Nikki, same hair and shirt, dwarfed by upperclassmen, dashes along the gauntlet, scared. 
Interior bathroom day. Nikki huddles in a ball, bracing himself, above, bracing himself above the toilet. The door busts open, imposing seniors enter, waving plungers. Nikki pleads to heaven. Heaven is indifferent to shit boy. <laughs> Three. Despite what everyone says, size matters. Exterior suburban home, another four years later. Corsage in hand, 18-year-old Nikki straightens his tuxedo jacket and rings the doorbell. His plain Jane prom date opens the door while tongue wrestling a bearded redneck donning a vast pro shop cap. Behind Nikki, a behemoth monster truck towers over his beat up Geo Metro. Four. This also applies to your automobile. Interior frat party, another three years later. Nikki fixates on two sorority sisters playing beer pong. A frat guy spikes Nikki's drink. Nikki takes a swig. Five. Looking the wrong way can have dire consequences. Smash cut to exterior college campus night. A hopped up Nikki frantically runs naked across the quad, pursued by a legion of campus police. Interior jail night. Scruffy inmates part like the Red Sea, revealing naked Nikki in front of an overflowing toilet. A mop and bucket are presented to him. Exasperated, Nick begins to clean the masts. Six. <coughs> Don't mistake repetition for a sign. Interior fame and laboratory day. Title today. Adult Nick, 34, pushes his mop across a spotless floor. His tattooed arm is revealed by the, by the rolled-up sleeves of his janitor uniform. The harsh lessons of a cruel world forge Nicholas Sloan into the man he is today. Nick jealously eyes a suave physicist chatting with an attractive colleague. As they walk toward him, Nick conceals the wet floor sign and mops past them. Thwack! The couple slips and hits the floor. Nick's self-satisfied smirk says it all what we men of science have termed an asshole. <laughs> Interior fame and laboratory later. Nick mops in the background of a sterile physics lab. <laughs> Professor Selvaratnam, 50s, a Slavic physicist, Sasha, 30s, stare at an empty 10-foot cylinder, a 10-foot cylindrical glass tube. In a flash of blue light, a steaming panini sandwich appears inside. The professor smiles, jubilant. A breakthrough! This is what we need to save everything! What we need is more proof. The professor takes a bite of the sandwich. It's still warm. That's our proof. It's science. We can't verify a panini. We need a live specimen. We have to send We can't send Tony. I just taught him to pull the perfect macchiato. Tony, a chimpanzee, operates an espresso machine on a desk. Nick dumps out the trash. The scientists turn. Eyes light up. Nick? How would you like to be the most famous person in the world? I'd uh, like to be a lot of things, Professor, but as you can see, I'm busy. I have to rinse my mop after I save the world's energy crisis. Well, today your wishes come true, my dear friend. The sarcasm lost, Nick rolls his eyes. You see, before you are fully functional, Krona Taxidi Makane... It's a time machine. A crude term for it, but yes. Using the particle accelerator, we are able to move atoms at beyond the speed of light, displacing the laws of space and time as we presently know them. Sasha glares at him as Nick zones out. And we need you to test it. <coughs> You'll be the first time traveler, the Buzz Aldrin of the time. Yuri Gagarin was first in space. History was in my strong suit. <laughs> Sasha steps close to Nick. What do you say? Uh... Are you coming with me? Unfortunately, no. I have to properly document the process. Sasha leads Nick to the control panels. The digital display reads, date 1231-1999, hour 12.01.00, duration one minute. Look, you step inside, we set the dials for the date, time, and duration. You'll be in the past for one minute. Simple. Why one minute? Just enough time to grab one item from the air rock. That is all we'll need to validate our finding. Given this singular opportunity, an astute traveler put up for the age of the dinosaurs, the building of the Great Pyramids, the birth of Jesus, Gettysburg, or Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. But one moment in time preoccupied Nicholas Sloan. We hear the crowd and splat from the infamous match. <laughs> Nick snaps out of it. How much are you paying for this? The professor looks at Sasha. They hadn't considered this. The professor opens his wallet, empty. Do you take Discover? If you want to shoot someone's atoms through a particle accelerator, you pay in cash. Find some other chump, I'm fine, I'm fine right here. Real. Nick looks at himself for a long moment. 
Interior laboratory later that night. The lab dim and vacant, Nick sneaks, sneaks carefully inside. Tony spots him, jumping up and down. He rattles his cage. Be cool, man. Nick extends his hands, a can of, his, of espresso in one hand, his cell phone bearing Candy Crush in the other. Tony contemplates the offer, then snatches both. He scurries off to play the addicting game. Nick approaches the controls. He turns the dial to 96 hours, then squeezes into the tight-fitting cylinder. Exterior alley, night. In a flash of blue, Nick appears, stumbling onto the pavement. A drunk wipes his eyes. Nick rises to his feet and sets his wristwatch timer to 96 hours. Are you Tommen? No. Janitor. Nick rushes past him and into exterior suburban retail strip, night. A sedan cruises by, blasting EMFs unbelievable, as Nick runs through strip mall retail sprawl. At a vending machine, he inspects a local paper to verify the date, January 11th, 1991. The cover story, Presidential Disgrace by Hoodlums. The picture, school walls graffitied with, a giant, with giant ass cheeks. <laughs> Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School, night. Nick climbs up onto a dumpster. From a distance, he crawls through the window, perfectly positioned between the ass cheek graffiti. Interior middle school locker room, night. Nick opens a cabinet and finds a stockpile of bottled laxatives. Nick pours them down the sink. In the cabinet above the sink, he finds another stash. My God, how much do you need? He sweeps the bottles into a trash bin. On the desk, Nick spots Coach's roster divided into two columns. One half, heroes, a long list of names. The other half, pussies, only one. Sloan, Nicky. <laughs> Nick crumples up the paper. Staring at himself in the mirror, he tears open his jacket to reveal, in full Superman splendor, his name tag. N-I-C. Interior Sloan Kitchen, morning. A typical lower middle class suburban home, overwhelmed with bills, grocery bags, and a non-functioning dishwasher. 11-year-old Nicky stuffs his book bag, his essay, his sassy, single mom, Evelyn Sloan, 30s, packs his lunch. Nicholas, bagel BLT. Oh, we just had that for breakfast. If you eat it for lunch, it's lunch. He reluctantly takes the lunch bag. I'm working a double, you'll have to walk home. Look both ways before you cross, and if someone offers you candy, don't get in the car. Yeah, sure, Mom. I don't want to see your face on the milk carton, okay? Come on. Mom, I'm late. Then you better hurry. Nicky rolls his eyes before reading off the inspirational quote of the day on the fridge. We would accomplish many more things if we did not think of them as impossible. Vince Lombardi. He's a coach. He knows. Exterior bus stop morning. Nikki's rotund and unfortunately named friend, Chuck Fatman, 11, <laughs> turns to Nikki a half a block away as the bus approaches. Hurry, man. Don't rush me. I'm in wrestling, not track. Right. You can't make track with gnome feet. I don't have gnome feet. Fine. Hobbit feet. <laughs> Nicky checks out his feet as the school bus pulls up. Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School, morning. Nicky and Chuck step off the bus. Nick stands further down the sidewalk, pretending to dump uh, out the trash. He beams at the sight of his younger self. Dude, why is that guy staring at you? <laughs> That's not staring at me. He's staring at you. Nick smiles widely and waves at them. Nicky Sloan. Chuck Fatman. Hey, Fatman! Jordan Paul, 13 pushing 16, launches a sneak attack as a VW Beetle pulls up to the school. Punch buggy, no punch back! License plate! With Chuck safe, Jordan clocks Nikki's arm. Nikki winces. Jordan smirks as pretty Jennifer, 13, emerges from the VW. Jennifer, I was waiting for you. Don't sweet talk me, Jordan Paul. She passes. Jordan follows, deftly puts his arm around her. Never trust a guy with two first names. Nikki turns to Nick, curious. The guy's a dick, all right? Next time he comes at you, what you do is, uh... Nick starts to posture a UFC move. Let's <laughs> keep walking. The boys race off, leaving him in mid-pep talk. Interior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School, office day. Nick leans on the counter as his secretary flips through files. Nicholas Sloan, reading... Math, earth science, then lunch. Quit slacking off! Assistant Principal Horner, 40s, clad in a padded shouldered suit, surges into the room. The custodial break is 10 minutes. During that time, three eighth graders vomiting in the chemistry lab. Someone let the chinchilla out of homeroom 5, and the teacher's lounge toilet is all backed up. Well, some, somebody better get on that. That someone is you, Nick. She walks toward her office. Man, what a big... Horner hovers behind him. Big 
room this this is. Warner <laughs> points at the counter where he was leaning. Make sure he wipes that down. Interior hallway, day. A plume of yellow vapor puffs out of the chemistry lab. Six students line the hallway. Nick covers his mouth and enters the lab. Interior chemistry lab continues. Nick wades through the vapor and opens a window, then steps in the puddles of vomit. He dry heaves as he mops the floor. Interior cafeteria day. Students dine in their respective cliques. Chuck sits with his not-so-cool friends, Aaron Wu, 12, big glasses and hand-me-down clothes, and Tim Wilson, 11, half black, half white, and abnormally tall. Nikki plops down next to Chuck, who inspects his lunch bag. Is that bacon? You're pathetic. Mm -hmm. My mom's got all hell nutty. Chuck's lunch, carrots, celery, a Tupperware of egg whites. <laughs> I'll take it. You're not eating? Aaron, new character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 93 pounds. I'm not going to make weight. The coach is going to kill me. Just skip practice. No, I can't. That man will hunt me down. He's not a man. He's a bloodhound. Oh, I missed you, Bacon. Why sports? If you want intensity, let's step it up on the D&D. &D. The Dungeons and Dreadmore module has high-level monster well, my stuff. My mom says sports are a healthy outlet to nurture brotherhood. Then she should just join the team. Dude, yeah. if Chuck's mom joined, I would totally start. <laughs> yeah, I'll wrestle her. Uh, shut up, guys! Uh, who's wrestling who now? The entire wrestling team stands behind Jordan Paul. Why don't you sit with us, Sloan? Aren't you part of the team? Uh, I'm with my friends. What team are they on? Debate. Class. <laughs> Chess. Does fan count? Wow, you know how to pick them, Sloan. You're better with us. Jordan motions as two bo big boys pick up and carry Nikki away. Nikki pleads to his friends for help, but they cower. Hold it. The janitor blocks the path of the wrestling team. Put the kid down. The wrestlers drop Nikki to the ground. Who do you think you are, Jordan Paul? <laughs> I'm Jordan Paul. And I ain't no sorry janitor for sure. That's, That's a, a double, double negative, negative. douchebag. What did you call me? You think you rule this school? You think you're so special, but you know what? Nobody likes you. Isn't that right, Nikki? All eyes turn on Nikki. The entire cafeteria falls quiet. Yeah? You don't like me, Nikki? Spotlighted, Nikki bolts out of the cafeteria. Interior hallway, day. Nikki flees through the hallway. Suddenly, A.P. Horner latches onto him and drags him to a halt. Mr. Sloan, there is no running in my hallway. I'm sorry, Miss Horner. How do you explain this? Well, there was a situation... It was a rhetorical question. Detention. After school. <laughs> what are you wrestling practice? <laughs> oh, yes. What will the team do without its star? Get serious, Mr. Mr. Sloan. You're no Jordan Paul. Nick rushes down the hall searching for Nikki. This is a school, not a gymnasium! Nick halts. He sees Nikki in Horner's claws. Did he cause trouble? Uh, no ma'am. No, 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 but he, he was the one who... Quiet! I have no qualms adding to your detention. He got detention? Of course. Oh, that's... awesome. <laughs> Nikki glares at Nick, furious at this stranger. Excuse me? You're awesome. I, I am? I am. What are you doing tonight? Nick, <laughs> Nick looks down at Nikki, who coldly stares back at him. Interior school hallway later that day. Coach Wolf, sniffing, march, sniffing, marches through the halls. Exterior Gerald R. Ford Middle School day. Coach bursts out of the exit. Nick tosses trash bags into the dumpster. Coach is drawn to him by the scent. You see a little runt of a boy? About yay high? Oh, him. Uh, he went home. Coach takes a good look at Nick. Sniffs. I think your intel is off, son. I saw him walking home with his fat and nerdy friends. Coach sniffs again, up close, confirming the source. I'm losing my edge. Coach spots, spots his laxatives in the trash. What's that? Oh, nothing. Just cleaning out the chem lab. Coach reaches for it. Hold it. That's, that's toxic. Nick moves to block him, but the coach crunches him in a headlock. What do you know about toxic, boy? You ever breathe Agent Orange in the swamps of Danang? <laughs> Nick muffles a response as a glaze of Nam falls over the coach. <laughs> they wanted it to sound all sweet and citrusy. He hoists and tosses Nick into the trash. 
<laughs> Coach snatches up an unopened bottle. Nick struggles as if in a child's ball pit. Let me tell you, there's nothing on it about it. Interior detention classroom day. Nikki, uh, Nikki, a gum chewing girl, a boy with a constant nervous twitch, and a Mohawk kid watch the clock approach 4 p.m. AP Horner inspects a pile of contraband. An NWA cassette, a Victoria's Secret catalog, Hatcher in the Rye, cigarettes. <laughs> Heavy footsteps echo in the hallway. Interior Gerald R. Ford Middle School hallway day. Coach Wolf marches toward the door and whips it open, coming face to face with Horner, who eyes him with disdain. I need to report a theft. A theft? Oh my god. Someone raided right my inventory. I'm sorry. You've mistaken me for someone who cares. Bell rings. Horner leaves, followed by her detainees. Exterior Gerald R. Ford Middle School Day. Crawling out, Nick rushes toward the nearest entrance. Interior detention classroom day. Coach Wolf opens the closet to find Nikki. Sloan, the air is thick with your putrid hormones. Attention! Nikki jumps out and stands at attention. Were you about to sneak attack me, Sloan? Like some VC tunnel rat? No, sir. Why were you MIA? I was ambushed at lunch and left to rot in this POW camp, sir. <laughs> As I heard the recon. Interior hallway day. At an intersection, seeing Warner, Nick forks a left. Interior classroom day. But falling into enemy hands is no excuse to miss practice. You're miles behind. Are you over Sloan? Three pounds, sir. Coach tears off his UMC cap. We see the chrome of his dome. God damn it, Sloan! Nicky swallows his saliva, bracing himself for the worst. If we're gonna have any chance of beating Hillcrest, I need you to lose that weight. I'll do my best, sir. Better than your best. You leave me with no other options, son. Coach covertly fishes out the bottle of liquid laxative. <laughs> I'm initiating Operation Foxhole. Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School Day. <laughs> Through the window, Nick witnesses the illicit transfer. Now let's go get that W. Get that W. Hoo-ha! Hoo-ha! Crap. <laughs> Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School Day. Nicky slouches toward home. Suddenly, Nick swipes his backpack takes off. Hey! Thief! Nicky takes a couple of steps, then stops. He squats down and pumps up his Reeboks to give him a needed boost. <laughs> Exterior suburban sidewalk. Moments later, Nick turns onto an adjacent street. Nicky takes a detour. Suburban backyard. Moments later, Nicky dodges an angry terrier and hops over a hedge. Suburban sidewalk. Moments later, Nick slows, winded. He blows his air out of his face as he looks behind. The coast is clear. Suddenly, Nicky side tackles him onto a leaf pile. As they wrestle over the bag, it unzips and the laxative bottle drops, shattering on the pavement. They freeze, shocked. Oh man, oh man, oh man. He whips around to Nick. Now what's wrong with you? Why are you ruining my life? Whoa, I'm trying to help you. Help? This isn't help. Trust me, there's... Nick scrambles for an explanation. He points to his name tag. How do I say this? I'm an undercover investigator with the National... Intervention Council. Looks <laughs> like a janitor's uniform. I said undercover, didn't I? We're investigating juicing in junior varsity sports. Juicing? <laughs> Performance enhancing drugs. It's a real epidemic. I'm not on drugs. Nick nods at the oozing green laxative. Really? That's a gateway drug. No way. <laughs> True story. A kid in Kings County juiced. His testicles shriveled the size of a peanut. <laughs> Nikki processes the info. Well, Coach says it'll help me get a W. You're a smart kid. Put it together, Nikki. Don't be a putz. Coach doesn't care about you. He thinks you're a pussy. The truth smacks Nikki. His shoulder drops. I probably wouldn't win anyway. Nikki grabs his bag and walks. Nick watches his dawdling gate. Hey, I'm not done yet. Done what? Offering you some perspective. What's that supposed to do? Oh, I suck. Nick takes in the defeated and demoralized boy. We've been watching you very closely. We know that you have great potential. We? I told you, I'm with the NIC. And with the right training, you can be a champion. A real killer. <laughs> Seriously. You got good bones. Don't you want to win for once? Nick stands surprised by his own question. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, okay then, well then, let's show them. Nick and Nikki march on with renewed determination. Where are we going? To get inspired. Interior Village Videoplex, evening. 
Nick and Nikki per peruse the meager workout video section. Nick waves the Heather Locklear workout tape. <laughs> um, that's for girls. Oh, I beg to differ. Nikki holds the VHS of Jean-Claude Van Damme's Bloodsport. Oh, look at him. He's ripped. <laughs> this is a workout. That's a movie. No, it's inspirational. <laughs> so is this. The argument continues as they approach the clerk, Margot, late 20s, short-haired Gen X poster girl. Chill. There's a special two-for-one. Nick hands over the tapes. She cocks a disapproving look. It's for the kid. Yeah. It's Taekwondo. A solid green belt. Nikki notes the lie, but Saber's watching the R-rated movie. Is he your kid? No. Are you a child molester? What? <laughs> no. That'll be two fifty. Nick hands over a big-headed Hamilton, and she inspects a big-headed Hamilton, and she inspects him. We're a real store. We take real money. She slides back the future currency. Nick nudges Nikki, who pays out his hard-earned allowance. Exterior, Fatman's house, evening. A nice suburban home, the basement window glows. For 2,000 years, knowledge passed from father to son. Father to son. Interior, Fatman's basement, evening. On the zenith, Nikki and his friends, and Nick, watch Bloodsport. Teach me. I can do it. You told me using any technique that works never to limit myself. <laughs> On screen as pounding music plays, Frank Dürr and his master train. The master repeatedly knocks Frank Dürr to the ground. Montage, exterior suburban streets morning. The training music continues. Nikki garbed in a black trash bag poncho runs hard. Nick pedals, keeping pace on a too small boy's BMX. Nikki stops, kneels down. Hey, keep those knees up. Nikki resumes running. Fatman's basement, evening. On screen, Frank Dürr fights blindfolded. Fatman's backyard, day. Nikki blindfolded, grasps at the air as Nick pushes the tire swing toward him. The tire smacks him again and again. Fatman's basement, evening. On screen, Heather Locklear and her spandex-clad honeys perform aerobic squats. Nick, Nikki, Aaron, and Tim simply stare at the screen, heads tilted in awe of Heather's lunges. Chuck vigorously mimics the aerobic moves, unnatural. <laughs> Fatman's basement evening. On screen, close up on Frank Dua's contorted face, the camera pulls out to reveal him tied up and being quartered by ropes. Fatman's backyard, day. Close up on Nikki's grimacing face, camera pulls out to reveal Nikki holding ropes tied to Nick and Chuck's bikes. Fatman's basement evening. On screen, Frank Dua dodges his master's attacks. Fatman's backyard, day. Nikki adroitly dodges the tire swing. Suburban sidewalk day, Nikki hustles, sprinting past Nick on the BMX. Fatman's backyard day, Nikki re releases the ropes. Nick and Chuck veer out of control and crash. Nikki flexes, triumphant. Sloan bathroom, morning. Nikki looks down at the scale, the dial settles on 88. Sloan home, moments later, Nikki bounces out of the bathroom. Mom, I made my weight. A boy your age shouldn't obsess about his weight. But I've got to get that W. All you'll get is anorexia. What's that? It's a disease afflicting supermodels. I'm not a supermodel. Well, then stop acting like one. I made your favorite pancakes. <laughs> Why'd you make me join the team just to make me a laughing stock? I'd have suggested chorus, but you can't hold it too. Well, chorus isn't full of jock jerks. You're making friends. It doesn't matter to me if you lose. It matters to me. I'm not a loser. She squeezes out a heartfelt smile. If it's that important, I'll swap shifts and be there with pom pom. Uh, you will? She hugs him. Evelyn eyes the new quote on the fridge. What does the fridge say? <laughs> <sighs> Control your own destiny or someone else will. Jack Welch. Who's Jack Welch? He makes grape juice. <laughs> In, interior cafeteria day. Nikki hands Chuck his lunch en route to join the wrestler's table. What just happened? Pepperoni happened. Interior video store later that day. Nick drops the video into the return slot. You're late. She points to the sign. Two day rentals. Kids, what can you do? You can't shoot them and you can't shoot them. <laughs> Why are you hanging out with him if you hate him? I don't hate him. She waves the videos in his face. Why else would you infect him with this crap? <laughs> it's a classic. Nothing from the 80s is a classic. I'm supposed to trust your taste. Nick indicates Margot's staff picks. Foreign and taste. indies. My taste is eclectic. Oh, where's Enter the Dragon, uh, Top Gun, Animal House? When you curate garbage, it's still garbage. Nick smiles at her sass. 
Can I ask you something? What? You're young and smart. Why work at this dead end job? Dead end. Maybe I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. She thinks I'm this. What are you doing after work? Not hanging out with you. <laughs> right. He goes to leave. You still have a late fee. Nick rifles through his pockets, finds a 2014 era $10 bill. Put on my tab. Interior gymnasium evening. On the bleachers, students huddle in their cliques. Nick checks his watch, counting down from 60 minutes. He approaches Nikki, warming up near the bench. Okay, kid. Moment of truth. It's not about winning or losing. It's how you play the game, right? No, it's, it's all about winning. <laughs> Jordan Paul tosses his sweatshirt to Jennifer, who giggles with her friends. Behind her, Nikki sees his eager friends, Chuck, Tim, Aaron. You want Jennifer? If you want Jennifer to catch a sweater, then you need to win. Well, that's easy for you to say. You're not the one in the ring. Nikki marches to the bench. Nick sits by Chuck. I brought you boys a snack. Chuck's hot mom, 30s, hands Chuck, Aaron, and Tim each a snack well slow fat snickerdoodle cookie. It's lofty, tasty, and good for you. She smiles a sultry smile at Nick. He can have mine. Mine too. They fixate on Chuck's hot mom descending the steps. Dude, how did you come out of that? <laughs> Chuck's hot mom sits beside the enthusiastic Evelyn. Nick brightens up fondly at the sight of his youthful mom. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Gerald R. Ford is proud to host Hillcrest. Interior gymnasium later. On the mat, Jordan Paul takes down a bigger boy with an absurd, obnoxious suplex. The referee whistles the victory. The crowd cheers as the game is tied, 3-3. Three to three. Next up, the lightweight category. For Gerald R. Ford, Simone. And for Hillcrest, Akmatova. Nick cheers on. Sloan, front and center! Nicky steps off the bench. A plume of chalk surrounds him as he tugs at his suit. He waves to his cheering friends. A hooded Akmatova stands up. Removing the jumper, the wrestler is a stern, ponytailed girl. <laughs> the crowd falls silent. Hushed murmurs as he nears the mat. Nicky looks on, stunned, as, he, as she sizes him up. Shake hands. Nikki wearily shakes her firm hand. Coach and Nick, victory-obsessed mirror images, hype Nikki on. Nikki! Oh, no mercy! Don't hold back, no you've got this! you got this. Time slows. <laughs> Nikki gazes across the mat at Akmatova. The whistle blows. <laughs> Akmatova charges. Nikki remains frozen. In a flash, she throws him down. Pin. Head facing the crowd, Nikki witnesses his friends shamefaced. His mother gasps, dismayed. Akmatova his, uh, grabs his chin and turns his face towards her. You let me win. I'm no charity case. This ain't over, Sloan. From the bleachers, Nick sits stunned, shocked. Oh my god, his life is over! <laughs> Hearing this, Nick stands and applauds. In solidarity, Chuck, Tim, and Aaron join him. Everyone Woo! turns. No one joins in. They're clapping hollows. Nick shamefully sits, looks at his watch. Fifteen minutes remain. Interior locker room later. Nicky shoves his uniform into his bag. His teammates mock, uh, mock him behind his back. She rode you hard, Boulder! Nicky slinks away. Sloan, what happened out there? All that investment to make you a fighting machine and you lost. Too rock, girl. <laughs> Coach angrily tosses his hat into the shower. Was like you were while we lost Nam. <laughs> Nicky buries his shame in the palms of his hand. Interior school hallway moments later, Nick paces outside the locker room as Nicky sneaks out. Hey, Nicky. I, I just wanted to say. Nicholas! What? What? Nicky stares at Nick. <laughs> I'm proud of you. You did the right thing. You would never hit a girl. She embraces Nicky. Nick beams at her loving encouragement. Nicky fixates on Nick. <clears throat> Seeing Coach, Evelyn storms toward him, an engine of war. She aggressively shoves Coach into a locker. You like pushing around, little kids? Why don't you try me? Coach turtles as she rails against him. Nick grows antsy. His timer ticks down to three minutes. She's really something, isn't she? Ah, I messed up. It's all over. Look, Nikki, I know this seems like the end of the world, but trust me, it could have been a lot worse. Nikki stares blankly at Nick. Okay. Uh... This is it. Listen closely. Listen carefully. 
choose PlayStation over N64. Don't skip your SAT classes. Sheila Jones is a skank, and don't take her to the prom. Invest in Apple. <laughs> now, be supportive when Chuck comes out of the closet. Tell mom that you love her. The force is strong with you, Nikki. Remember that. You gotta control your own destiny. I gotta go, kid. Goodbye. Nick races toward the exit. Nikki watches on. There's a saying. You can't step in the same river twice. Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School night. Nick rushes into the empty parking lot. He taps his watch. Nicholas Sloan couldn't fully comprehend a lifetime supply of aphorisms. But in all honesty, that one about the river doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Splash forward. Interior, Feynman Laboratory 2014. Professor Salvaratnam blocks hard hat wearing repo men. This is the most important research happening in America. Sorry, Doc. Funding's been slashed. Professor Salvaratnam opens Tony's door, uh, cage door. Run, Tony! Run! You're <laughs> free! Shut it down! A repo man pulls the plug on the time machine. The machine goes dead. Countdown stops at three seconds. Tony runs, not toward the exit, but to claim the espresso machine from the grips of a repo man. The professor throws his papers into the air as Sasha finds a fabric thread in the cylindrical glass tube. She holds up the fabric th thread to the professor who realizes in horror that someone was inside the machine. Repo men barricade the time machine with yellow caution tape. Unlike the other species on this planet, only humans have threats. Exterior, Gerald R. Ford Middle School, night. Nick taps his watch anxiously. Come on, come on! In our attempts to understand our mistakes, we spend our lives looking backward. But perhaps we should be looking inward. For as the King of Pop once sang, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. <laughs> I know who you are. Nikki stands in the open doorway. You're me. Nick and Nikki face off. Oh. <laughs> End of show. First of all, I should thank my writing partner. I mean, thank you, uh, your actor. You guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. To hear it loud and for a Can you guys all hear? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I can project more. I'm sorry, I'm not an actor. I'm uh, <laughs> Because I could else. get mics too. Would that be better? We'll project. Can project? you hear us now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> what he said is. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, um, thank you, actors. Uh, and also, I should mention. The, this script was co-written by my writing partner, uh, Myron Tiruchelvum. Um, he can't be here because he's in LA at the moment, living a bi-coastal life. Um, anyway, we've been writing together for about two years now, and we've written a bunch of projects together. And uh, this is the first time, the first time we write a to write TV. Um, I remember, I mean, we had this, we had this um, idea about, I mean, some of the illusions are very obvious, right? Like, stuff, I'm sorry, my heart. I have, like, head hair, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, like, you know, like, we love Back to the Future. We love, like, like a lot of 80s and 90s references. Uh, that's what made us in many ways. And, made us want to be filmmakers, so it's sort of like, mm. sort of lovingly remembering that. And also, uh, there's this thing about, I don't know, I'm sure you guys all think about this, like, with what I know now about my life, what I could do if I went back and <laughs> changed that one thing, you know, some aspect of your life, how different would be. So, I mean, that, that sort of question where What is your process when you collaborate with someone? 
Uh, he's the only person I've worked uh, with. Well, that's actually not true. I've collaborated with one other person. Uh, but uh, to uh, help uh, my friend write her thesis, though, uh, to the But um, on a feature or on television, he's the only person that I really work with. And it's, it's a weird thing. I mean, collaborating, I don't know if any of you guys collaborate, but it's such a weird process. Um, um, when he's in New York, we spend a lot of time in the room together. When we're not, we're kind of like, I don't know, it's weird, it's like internet dating or something. Like we're, wa <laughs> we're watching each other through Google Chat, and, we're like, and Google Chat is like a lifesaver. It's amazing. Like, I, it's, I can't imagine. Because I don't know how to do this over a phone or like, but the great thing about Google Chat is like you can also open a third window, which is like the document that we're working on, uh, and we can both see it and and knowing what's being written, how it's being written, that's really really important. So like the fact that we can both look at it, it's, you know, if you couldn't do that without that, so it's like it's like kind of completely altered what it could be. Um, we spend a lot of time talking. A lot of it's talking. And we spend a lot of time outlining. Um, and, I mean, with different projects, we work slightly differently. But we always come up with an outline first, and then uh, do like character background, character sketches, um, and then um, you know, I mean, what? First of all, we, I mean, we discuss what is the show about, really, in its essence. What is that really about? And, you know, and then from there, we kind of move on and talk about. From like structural and character, and what's working, what's not working, what's funny, what's not funny, which is a really tough, tough thing. I, mean, I think it's funny sometimes, sometimes I don't. Some of you may think it's funny, some of you may not. It's such an odd kind of humor. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, I don't know, it's a really tough process, but we send documents back and forth. We have, uh, I think we started writing this. Um, Maybe January this year. Yeah. And, you know, we a I mean, when you're talking about structure, TV writing is highly structured. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk to us about have you created the Bible? Um, we haven't created a proper Bible. Um, we have like larger arcs. What is the what the season going to look like? What are the episode catches going to look like? What are the problems? Uh, I mean, one of the things that I really like is the fact that we set it in 1991, so that it's it's on the cusp of the beginning of the Iraq War. I go, I mean, the Gulf War, right? Desert Storm, way back in the day. And I remember like thinking that that's really cool, and like you know, exploring a country going to war in the backdrop of this comic, uh, things like that. Um, I mean, I don't know if you guys know what a show Bible is, but show Bible. But it's um, it's basically a document that spells out what the essence of the show is and where it's going to go and what are the episodes about, what are the themes about, and characters and all of them. But um, um, we didn't fully write one. Um, we just have sketches of episodes that we that we hope to see in the future. Um, <coughs> uh, it was my first time writing TV. My writing partner, uh, Myron, he's written more TV than I have. I am, my, my friends know me as a cinephile. I, I'm a TV <laughs> lover of film, so like the idea of writing TV was actually really, really bizarre. <laughs> like, I never thought I would write TV, let alone a sitcom. But as I was getting into it, uh, I don't know, there's something charming and something sincere in the piece that I really, really like and that really resonates. Um, I think that's what keeps me pushing to make it better. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, you asked about structure, right? Uh, each, I mean, I, I have to watch so many shows. I, I stopped watching TV after I left high school. I, I don't know. After high school, I stopped watching TV, so I have to like, go back and like, 
I think I watched the entire five seasons of Arrested Development in a week. <laughs> like I do these really marathon uh, film and film show, TV show viewings just to like catch up. I've never seen Fruits and Peaks. And that's definitely like you know, and that show's wonderful. And they did a great job with that show and, and the problems of that world and those characters. So it's definitely inspired by that. It's definitely inspired by like Wonder Years. Who doesn't love Amy Cooper? <laughs> I, still have, I still have a question on Amy Cooper. Um, um, yeah, I just watched a lot of shows. Because each show is different. And it's, uh, so it's like so What are the possibilities? Yeah. It's always interesting also to watch the pilot of a series that went on for years mm -hmm. to see just how they set up every character and the situation. I mean, it's brilliant when you're binge watching and then go to the first one again mm -hmm. and say, wow, that's how I met all these people. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's, I mean, those of you who are interested in writing TV, just walk. Part of me doesn't like advocating for this because it hurts my my, cine, my cinephile tendencies. But like, yeah, watching TV helps you write for TV because it's it's a weird it's a weird structure. I, I still don't fully understand it. Watch it, like, and also like it's also weird because like you're watching on Netflix. You know, you're watching these programs usually on Netflix, right? And because you don't you don't get that hard commercial break that you normally get. So it's a little disorienting because it just goes into the next scene. Whereas if you watch that on when it was airing properly, you'd see it and then you see serials or whatever, what is it, advertising. Uh, and then you see that hard break and you get come back to it. And those are the app breaks that are coming on TV, not, not HBO. Right? There's no commercial, which is a very different type of writing. Yeah, but, um, yeah, despite this, you know, my writing partner and I are still writing we're writing another show. It's a drama now. But sounds fun. Sounds cool. Even though I still love movies. I swear. <laughs> Let's take a few questions from the audience. Comments. Because this is a great opportunity for Willem to get feedback from you. Yes. yes. Um, great, great job, by the way. It's really wonderful. Really cool. Thank you. And um, I know it's like hot right now for TV, right? Everyone's doing TV, writing TV, great actors are acting, and so on. So, so, did that affect you decide to um, go to TV, like, or maybe try it? I mean, I think since like 2000, and especially since like 2008, 2009, um, like that's when all those indie production companies start dying, like Warner Independent and it's so many like very reputable production companies that that would make these uh, low budget films or independent films would they die? So like the avenue of making films like now you have to make these ginormous you know tentpole films or like nothing. It's really really hard to make those smaller films. With that said, I mean in TV there's the opportunity is much greater, and you know. There's TV, and then you know, there's that other thing, the internet thing. You know, internet like Amazon. Is that TV? It's still a question. I don't even know what it is. Like, it is TV. It's, it's like not quite TV, but it's not quite HBO. So what is it? I guess it's closer to HBO than it is to network. Um, uh, but they also start having. They kind of have their own structure too. You know? uh, and then there's like difference between HBO versus like AMC or. FX, you know, they still have commercial breaks uh, within it. Some of them don't. Uh, I don't know, this, there's more opportunity because you know, there's so many vendors. Like even Hallmark is making their own, mm -hmm. trying to launch their own channel with their own content. Um, Amazon, Hulu, I mean, just more, more people are just making it. You know? So that's why you switched over. <laughs> I guess it's hard, but it's also like, I mean, I've never wrote a sitcom, right? So it's more like, 
It sounds fun. You know, I mean, I don't want to. I don't just want to make movies. You know, I, mean, I, I, I do want to make movies, and I do want to make documentaries, and I do want to pursue really good television. But I don't know. Just expand yourself. I mean, it's being tested, really. Pushing myself to different. You know, challenge myself to. to Different mediums, different formats, different. And then I, I swear to God, like everyone knows me as the guy who watched who loves like Tarkovsky, Bresson, Bergman, these really heavy, like oh my God, existential angst. I'm gonna slip my wrist, I'm so depressed. Kind of like films. You know, that, that's what I love. So like the idea that my friends think like, what a sitcom? That's so weird. It was fun. It was challenging in a different way. Just like the hour. I mean, I've never had a writing collaborator before him either. So, like, that was also challenging. Like, how do you grow as as someone who's pursuing, you know, these artistic endeavors? Like, how do you push yourself? You know? I, mean, I think it's good to meet fellow travelers. I mean, it's a, writing is a very lonely road. So, I think just having companionship, you know, as the great philosopher Winnie the Pooh said, better with two. <laughs> I really believe that. Better with two. We have time for one more question or comment from the. Yes. Um, well, th this time, like reading it, it just something struck me, like this, like that, like like jumping over that dog, that terrier, mm -hmm. and it's just something about it that just reminded me of that that chase in, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off at the end. Mm -hmm. Is that is that like um like other other than the content of like what it is like is it also stylistically a throwback to like that era like uh. Herman's Head and Parker Lewis Can't Lose, like a multi-camera traditional sitcom, maybe without a laugh track, but like, you know. I mean, it, I mean, I, I fully, I mean, if I if I had my own way about it, I would shoot single camera. I don't want multi-camera. Uh -huh. okay. Definitely single camera. Um, uh, I mean, there are definitely a lot of allusions to 80s and 90s. Uh, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit it. I've never watched Ferris Bueller. <laughs> really uh, but I did like Park Lewis Can Lose as a kid. I remember watching it. Oh, this is fun. Because you know, it like, takes place in New York. And I remember him. Wait, is it Park Lewis? Oh, that takes place in New York, right? Like, like, I Because I have this memory of him like, blocking potential. Uh, I mean, these people in the subway who are trying to take a seat and like, he wants to get up and it's friend wants to sit, <laughs> but like there's other people who are hovering trying to take the seat once he gets up, yeah. so he has to like, you know. yeah, that's what I meant, <laughs> Park Lewis, I think that's Park Lewis, it's been so, it's been so long. Did you feel that, um, just from wrapping it up, that the presentation today helped you think about the script? And yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, especially with comedy, like, you know, me and my writing partner, we could laugh about it all we want in our room, but it has to be, you know, you have to get a sense of it from the room, what's working, what's not, uh, and, and you can't, I mean, there's no better way to get that than, than hearing aloud and getting a visceral reaction. I, I, I have a tendency not to trust people's answers when they ask. When they ask me, like, you know, when they tell me, like, I, they give me some answer that's very intellectual, problematic. I like, I like visceral, bodily reactions. I cry. I, I, I'm I don't scared. Think cry too. Or yeah, or I laugh. You know, it's like, it's like things that are like literally associated with your body, yes. and your body is reacting to, to. Image or the presentation of the art or whatever it is. It's that visceral reaction that's like, in the So, did you get laughs? Yeah, when I, you yeah, thought you were going to yeah, I, I got thoughts where I thought I would get it, I got lots. Like, <laughs> uh, I didn't get laughs where I hoped they would get it, I got laughs where I didn't know what they were laughing at. You know, but, like, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, oh, I wonder why that, you know. And like, it's like you have a certain. 
you think you wrote it in a certain voice and then you feel it out and it's like external to you and it's like, whoa, it's a little odd and it's a little weird. It's also kind of like charming because it's, I mean, you want it to live outside of you and you don't want it to be voices in your head. Because, you know, you know, it's very problematic to get voices in your head. <laughs> uh, so you want it to exist external to you, but same time it's completely foreign that it's going to be. So it was awesome. Well, good. Congratulations Thank to you. you. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you, guys. So now, shifting gears just a bit, I'd like to introduce Savannah Washington. Here I am. And she'll introduce the first to us. Hi, it's great to be here tonight. And um, so thanks for having us. We really appreciate it and having the film this evening. Uh, you're going to see about a 13 minute excerpt of the film. And we're in editing. We just started our rough assembly. Hopefully, you all got a card our movie card. So do stay in touch with us. Uh, you'll see the information for the website, and it'll be live next week. We're, we're beta testing right now. But you can get on um, uh, our Indiegogo page. We are crowdfunding. So please spread the word. And even if you can't contribute, do please just pass the information along and, and, do, and sign up for our mailing list. We'd love to stay in touch with you and let you know how the movie is going. So. I think we're done, so we'll see about the uh, 13 minute cut and then uh, we'll talk some more. Thank you. Welcome to DPRK. The United Nations says six million North Koreans, a quarter of the population, could be at risk of starvation. Well, to begin with, North Korea is a very small country, highly mountainous. There's not much land area which they can produce grains. According to the United Nations, the food situation there is better now than it has been for many years. But North Koreans, speaking freely in China, paint a dramatically different and alarming picture. Even in the showcase capital, one in five kids are stunted. Uh, there is no famine in North Korea. What you have is a chronic situation in which the current uh, agricultural practices make it such that the agriculture does not produce enough food for the people. Now you may ask, well, if they can't get the ration from the government, they might as well go and buy it. Well, that's exactly the problem because it's illegal. Because we are talking about a very brutal police state. And if the state doesn't provide it, well, then it's not there. And if somebody is accused of political crime, which might be very, you know, small thing, like, you know, telling, saying, telling a joke about the great leader, uh, that such a person will go to prison, of course. But all people, who share household registration with this person will go to prison as well. Yes, that's true. Her name is Song Hae Rim. She is the third wife of Kim Jong Il. She, her name was Song Hae Rim. I was uh, as a dancer, uh, and Kim Jong Il came to our performance quite a few times, so I was able to see him. When I was questioned, I wrote down everything about Song Hae Rim. But if I knew that I was going to be taken to, you know, Yodo camp, I would have not written down about Song Hae Rim. In North Korea, there are 10, you know, principles. And we are not to damage the reputation. And we are only to live in loyalty to Kim Il-sung and his family. That is the principle one. And how long did you remain in the Yodok uh, political prisoner camp? I was there for nine years.
I was a Colin Powell Fellow um, from 2009 to 2010 when I was in grad school. And General Powell had a conference on career reunification. And as fellows, I mean, we were just expected to attend. And I didn't know anything about North Korea, but then I realized nobody else did either. <laughs> and so I was really surprised. I am a big political news junkie. I, I really am very engaged in international news. And it was really shocking how little I knew about North Korea. And one of the things that was happening, um, uh, everybody who was anybody was in the room, of course, because you know General Powell was there. And uh, one of the things I found out was that World Food Program had been trying, had been sending food aid to North Korea. I mean, I, I, I had no idea. And what they were saying was that, because uh, like Jerome Savage was saying, this constant or chronic malnutrition there, they had a huge famine in the 1990s that they think killed upwards of three million people. Um, and then in 2009 through 2010, they had another famine. But even between then, it's just, just this constant chronic malnutrition. And so World Food Program was just trying to get food to lactating mothers, you know, the, the, the population at high risk, uh, children two and under, and the elderly. They could not, they were running out of money and could not raise any money in the world, in the world, to feed these people. And I just thought that was heartbreaking, because there was no political will. I mean, Kim Jong-un was still in, uh, in power, and Under Secretary General Pasco from the United Nations was there, and he was talking about how it's really important to try to really separate humanity from politics. And I just thought that was so powerful. And Dr. Lee was there, um, the gentleman who spoke at the beginning, and he was saying the same thing. It's like, you know, who are we as people? Um, you know, Kim, the, the Kim Dynasty is is a different uh, is different from the people. You know, they're not suffering, but the people are. And so after he spoke, I said, well, you know, would it be helpful to have like maybe a short film, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes, just explaining, you know, the humanity of the people apart from the politics. And he said that would be very helpful. He said, you can't use our name. We can't, uh, <laughs> we can't do any public help for you, but anything <coughs> we can help you with. And um, that was, again, 2010. And I interviewed with Dr. Lee, and then I couldn't get any, any footage out of the country. No one had footage out of the country. It was just shocking. And so the, the documentary got put on hold. Um, I interviewed a few other people. And then in 2012, actually, the Korea Society started having this series on North Korea. And in the meantime, I had um, met the gentleman who used to be the executive director of the Asian American Film Festival at a panel. And I said, you know, if anyone can get me North Korean footage, it'd be this guy. And so I talked to him after the panel, and he said, I think I can help you. And he did. And he introduced me to Catherine, Kathy Zellweger, who, uh, who spoke here. And, um, and she was just really instrumental in, um, in putting me in touch with people and interviewing. And then the Powell Center actually gave me a production grant. And I went to North Korea last year, and uh, South Korea, and China. Because uh, we, we, we had we, rendezvous in Beijing, and then we went to um, went to North Korea. And I have to say, I, we walked across a bridge into North Korea. And you have amazing footage of that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the group. Tell us about the logistics of actually going there, and then we'll get into what you did there. <laughs> so uh, the tour company is Young Pioneer Tours, and where we were is North um, the northeast quadrant of the country, and that is where most of the famine took place. And so they had not let Westerners in this part of the country, because literally the further you are away from the capital, and the northeast quadrant is as far from Pyongyang as you can get in the country. So the further you are away, I mean, you're basically, it, it's like Siberia. Um, uh, so they had a really terrible, uh, they, they experience the worst of the food crisis. So they had not let Westerners in this section. And we were only the second tour group ever to go. The first tour group was eight people, and then we were the second group, we were 10 people. 
it was just me and another woman. She was like in her 70s and she was, excuse me, badass. <laughs> she's so my hero. She just came back from Iraq and Iran, so she's my, she's my hero. And um, her children, she said, her children were like, are you going, why are you going to North Korea? She said, you told me to get a life, I got a life. <laughs> <laughs> so she was my roommate in North Korea. Yeah. I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, so we, um, uh, yeah, so we rendezvoused, rendezvoused in China and, uh, and went to Tumen, which is the border city to, uh, to North Korea. And again, so we were the second group to go, and, and it was really surprising because it is a very poor area. And the second and third largest city are there, but it's still, uh, I mean, you, you see the, like I'm turning the, we were in the hotel, and this is like, they put us in the best hotels, and they were still pretty bad, and no running water. I mean, you see buckets, they would just bring us buckets of water to, to wash in. And I'm like, well, if we're the special guest, mm -hmm. you know, you can only imagine what's happening with the people. And power would just go out, like, willy-nilly. Did they know that you were a filmmaker? Uh, no. So uh, we all went on a tourist visa. And um, uh, about, about two weeks before I was going, because, you know, as a filmmaker, you know, you're just doing the work. You're just trying to get the stuff, to, you know, get, get the planning done, get the stuff done. And I went to North Korea first and South Korea, so I didn't want to take South Korean footage into North Korea. Yeah, and so I, kept, I left a bunch of stuff at the hotel and another suitcase, like a lot of my professional gear. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, so went in, and it was about two weeks before, I'm in bed and I was thinking things through, and I, I really just started hyperventilating a little bit. And I'm like, you know this is dangerous. And I'm like, no, think Florida, you're going to Florida. <laughs> and you really have to just psych yourself, I just had to psych myself out that I'm going to, you know, yeah, Iowa. What equipment did you take to Iowa with you? <laughs> <laughs> I just took, um, I took a high def camera that looks like a consumer camera, and um, and I had a little wide angle lens that was super small, and so and I, I was wondering why you know, they never said anything like why did she have a, a lens? why is she swapping lenses out, <laughs> and I was just like. I, you know, and I, I am so okay with playing the dumb tourists, you know, because they still have a, it's still very patriarchal. And so I was filming everything. I was filming all the time. And they just thought that was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> She's so excited about our country. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> But you also took some footage when you were not supposed to? Yeah, yeah. So I took, uh, we were not allowed to take footage on the running bus. And because part of where we were in this North Hamyang province uh, is where the political prison camps are. And so you, it could, you literally, the only cars or trucks you see on the road are government owned. And so all of a sudden we would be driving and you would just see this kind of government truck go off into nowhere. And you just knew, wow, that's not good. Um, so, and then again, they did not want us getting some of these images too. And so the, the, the street scene, it was 4.30 in the morning. It's light out early there. So it's like 4.30, 4.45, and we, the speakers start blasting really early. And me and Mildred woke up like, what the hell is that? And we get up and we look outside to see why there are little speakers on the outside of the buildings to wake everyone up. And we started seeing these people in the street. We're like, what are they doing? And we just stood there, and I, I finally, I, I had the sense enough to go, will you get your camera? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's transfixing, and because the, the first two people we saw were these senior ladies, and they had those stick rooms, and they're sweeping the street, this potted, rutted, hard street, and they're sweeping the street with these, these stick rooms. And it's like, this is unbelievable. And then, we were, and then more and more people started coming out. And I had interviewed Kathy Zellweger before I left, and she had just been in the country. And she said, and she was just annoyed. She's Swiss, and bless her heart. And she's just, she's very matter of fact. She said, they're doing this grass thing. I don't know what this grass thing is. Everywhere they're moving grass, like blades of grass. <laughs> blades of grass. Mm -hmm. So they, I guess they grew seeds, they grew from seeds. And then when they would, would, would grow, wherever it wasn't growing, they literally would take dig up blades of grass. And that's what you saw the women by the side of the road. They dig up individual blades of grass and moving them. And she said, this grass business was all over the country. She said, find out what's going on with the grass business. Because <laughs> she was annoying. 
just like these people are starving and really grass, blades of grass. So yeah, so we, we got that footage. I got footage. I did get footage from the moving moving um, bus. I got yelled at for that um, for the very first day, and I just smiled. And went, Oh, really? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's also beautiful. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so God love them. And, they, and our minders, eventually, they, they were very sweet. Everybody was lovely, but it's just, it's, it's a tough dichotomy. Tell us about the title. Yeah, we, um, Johnny, who you see playing Frisbee, uh, Johnny is Australian, big brassy guy, and, and Johnny is a world traveler, and he has, he's traveled to over 140 countries. And so they wouldn't let us interact with any everyday North Koreans. And so Johnny lost it, because we also had about, about five, day five, we're all getting cabin fever and bus cabin fever, and Johnny was started just went after the minders and like, well, you know what, this is ridiculous. You know, I've been to over 140 countries. You say your country is so great. Well, if it's so great, why are you afraid to let us even talk to anybody? And so, and Mr. So was just, he was, he was trying, we, we have to stay to the schedule, we have to stay to the schedule. This is ridiculous! So we get to this spa, and it's just basically a bathtub of water. And, uh, <laughs> and it's next to this little village that you saw in the, in the movie. And so Johnny and Mildred refuse to go into the spa. They're like, no, I'm not going. And Mildred's like, I'm not going either. <laughs> and so they just stood by the bus. And uh, what are you going to do, drag a 70-something year old woman into... So they were just like, okay. And so they, you know, whereas I was went in, and so I come out and I hear a ruckus. And I'm like, oh, it's Johnny. <laughs> and I went out, and at that point he was playing Batman with the village. <laughs> and then I was like, oh. and so the camera, then they said we couldn't take pictures unless they saw them. And at that point, everybody in the tour group pulled out cameras. So they really, literally lost control of us. And we all were filming or taking pictures or doing something. So I just started filming like mad. And Johnny started playing Frisbee with the entire village. And it was just this moment of, of humanity that you see. And you see the North Koreans. And they're just, it's just this sweet moment. And so we're, and so we're playing. And the minders were nuts. The minders were, like a couple sat down. Or like, and one got in and played a little. And the other one, another one sat down. A little other guy sat down. And, but the next day, they were, they were, they were freaked out. <laughs> They were freaked out. I mean, if we had to go to the bathroom, like, where are you going? Where are you going? I mean, it, it was bad. It was because they didn't know what repercussions would happen to them, because they're they're there to watch each other too. So it's for it was a driver, two minders, and then a guy to kind of carry that luggage. But our driver was me. He didn't speak English, so we couldn't like finesse him. <laughs> and so he was the one I think they were the most afraid of. They thought he was, they were going to turn him in. They thought he was going to turn him in. So they were freaked out the next day. And they never asked to see all of your footage? You know, they did. They put the last morning, they put a um, guy on the bus with us. And we had to sit there and go through every single shot. And so I hid uh, like a couple of SD cards. I hid like my SD card and then my internal memory. I didn't let them know I had internal memory. And, um, but we had, we just overwhelmed them with footage. Between the 10 of us, we figured we had like 5,000 pictures. Okay. I mean, because it was nuts. Right? And I have, like on one card, I have 523 clips. And so by the time he got to me, I was like person eight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he saw it was a video camera, but you know, you just see the, you just see the, you know, the, the thumbnails. And I had taken a lot of greenery. And so I would film something green, and then I would pan at something I wasn't supposed to film, and then I would pan back. So all you saw in the beginning was just green. So it was just like, like 250 pictures of just greenery. And he was just like. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, I wasn't going fast enough. He was like, <laughs> so I'm just showing him thumbnails. Heaven forbid I start playing footage. And he was just annoyed. He was mad he got that assignment. He was mad. He was Because we picked him up in the middle of the road. <laughs> he got on the bus. He was like, <laughs> and I said, I was about person eight. He was done. He was done. So we had just worn him out. So I don't think he really saw everything. So And then like, that was the only one card. My other two cards, he never saw. He never saw my internal memory. So where are you with the project? Uh, we just started, you know, we, we did this piece for fundraising, and we're doing a rough assembly now. So we're starting the rough assembly, <laughs> and, um, and I want to give a big shout out to my editor, Joshua Sarlo. I mean, he's been amazing. 
And uh, between the two of us, we work really well together. And you can see it, because we both have similar and different sensibilities. And, what, and it really is a great marriage of what we both bring to the table, so, oh. yeah. Let's open this up to the audience. Questions? Yes, in the back. Love oh. it. Hi. <laughs> First of all, I love it. Um, I mean, it's devastating, so I'm not saying that I love what's happening. I love what you captured. The laughter at the opening, just that laughter at the opening. That's me. I was I was film, doing the one filming, and it was so much fun, and it was such a lovely moment. And I just got, you know, sometimes you just get in the, you get in the present moment, and you get what, how special this is. And so it was just so lovely, and they were so, because one of the, the women that was on the telephone when I, I interviewed, asked, uh, her name is Deb, and um, she's a, 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 a defector, and she lives in Jersey, actually. And she said to me, there's an innocence about the North Korean people. But you have to remember, they're completely shut off. There's no internet, there's no, um, there's no in the rural areas, there's no phone service. Um, so there is an innocence. And, you, and I was just really, just really in the moment of that. And it was so pure. And I, sometimes I, I hear myself laughing, like, that sounds like me as a kid. I mean, but it was just mm -hmm. that, that, that was the sweetness of that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on a, a fictional thing, so it's, it's really amazing to, to see like, the amount of creation you've got. Yeah, thanks. And I have to give um, a shout out to a couple of, uh, there's some aid workers who worked in the country and there was another person who shot in the country and they asked me not to mention their names because they travel back and forth in the country, but they brought out footage too, like some of that, um, some of the aid workers who just kind of had unfettered access, um, it, it just was amazing some of the stuff they brought back um, and that they let me license from them anonymously. <laughs> Yes. I just want to say I thought it was brilliant, and I am also very engaged in international news. And I, you cannot find anything from North Korea. It's like a total blackout. Mm -hmm. But I thought maybe you and Willem could collaborate <laughs> on a Back to the Future to 1984 <laughs> in North Korea. Yeah. To be serious. <laughs> and also, I don't. You may get to this, but subtitles when the woman is being interviewed by the United Nations. Yeah. Yeah. Committee. Yeah, she because that was the actual translator from the United Nations, and so because um, we were trying to because because I interviewed her at her studio, mm -hmm. and um, so we do have the you know the, the transcripts from that. But this was we didn't want people to have we wanted you just wanted people to stay in the moment of it, and so that's why we we did use the the you know, UNCOI stuff and. Um, and, they, and they actually, uh, I met those guys, and they actually have asked me for some footage. So next week they'll be getting this. So. Yes, the gentleman. Um, the idea behind sanctions and embargoes is that the people will put pressure on the government and um, hopefully get that government to leave. Uh, it doesn't tend to work, and the people tend to suffer because people tend to be conformist. It's just the nature of, of psychology, human psychology, social psychology. Um, when it was done to Iran, when it's been done to Iran, these 80 million people have been somewhat self-sufficient and they've carried on. But the problem in North Korea is that uh, when you talk about these famines, uh, it's basically been babies that have died. And so what I'm asking is that your film, does it capture, um, does it touch on that aspect, the, the, the actual, the babies that have uh, died? And yeah, one of the aid workers, has a shot of a hospital, and literally the IV is a old plastic tube from a beer bottle. Because yeah. from a beer, beer bottle. bottle. Right. Because you know when you get into the rural areas. I mean, when you're in Pyongyang, Pyongyang is beautiful. I mean, when you go to the capital, the capital is amazing. But that's one, you, and you see the dot on the map, right? Um, that's that's the. But when you get anywhere outside the area. Um, and, and that's the problem with sanctions, because it, um, it it really does just hurt the the general people. And that was the problem that the World Food Program was having, trying to explain, you know, we're human beings. This is a human misery, a human story. How can we not give food to two-year-olds? How can we not have any political will to feed a two-year-old? 
And that just, that really messed me up. I mean, just like, what, what are we doing? And, well, I mean, well, we and can't who, do anything about it, right? We, we have to go through the government to be able to distribute, and the government won't let us. Uh, and that's it, right? Because the governments give to the World Food Program, right? Because they're part of the UN. And so they can just say, you know, well, yeah, we will give you food for, you know, anywhere else in the world, but none of this, this money can go towards North Korea. And then this is, some of this was um, happening, too, during George Bush, and they were the access of evil. So it just, as I said, there was no political will to get anything done. But, but in North Korea, the government in North Korea will not allow, they will not receive any. They, yeah, they, 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 had, they had thrown out, yeah, they had thrown out all the aid workers at one point. Uh, Kim Jong-il Kim Jong did throw out all the aid workers. And um, uh, I think around two, I can't remember the exact uh, the, the order right now, but he did start inviting people, aid back into the country. And what the AIDS organizations have done is like they don't do rice, because rice can store for a long time. It's a very highly valued commodity, especially for the upper echelon. So that's why you see they send in corn, because um, it has a, a, a shorter shelf life. It has to be distributed or it goes bad. And, um, and what they have to be able to do is go and do spot inspections. Um, and, but you know, but the dirty little secret about aid work is that, and, and Bill Gates says this, there's always some loss, there's always bleed off. And so we just have to anticipate that 20% bleed off is gonna go to, or 25% bleed off is gonna go to you know, the military, to the upper echelons. And nobody wants to hear that, but that's all over the world. I mean, that's, that's just the dirty little secret and, and that people don't wanna tell anybody because then everybody will be upset about giving an aid. But that's the, that's the price of doing business to get food to people who actually need it. So yeah, so the, the, what has happened is the people have, and you saw the marketplace, I mean, that was a marketplace, that street, um, and it's just nothing. It's little bits of nothing to try and, and sell. And then they, they, they changed the currency in 2009 or 10, and so people who had actually been doing a little bit okay in these markets, because that's capitalism, and at first they were like arresting people and throwing them in prison and, um, and you know, taking all their stuff out of these markets. And finally they realized, you know what, it's just, the situation's too dire. And so they started letting them do the markets and people started accumulating a tiny bit of a nest egg, a tiny bit of cushion, and they switched the currency. And you could only turn in like, I don't know, whatever the equivalent is for us for like 100 bucks, say. But like 100 bucks in your savings, think of that. So they were, people were wiped out. And that was the first time that people started revolting, started really, really bristling against Kim Jong Un, and he's uh, Kim Jong Il, and he saw he had made a horrible mistake, and so he said, "Well, no, this minister of so and so talked us into doing this, and, and he's a traitor, and they had him killed, and um, and I think he, he might even been publicly executed, but they had him killed, and they said, okay, yeah, never mind, um, but I mean they still didn't go back to the old currency, but." And this is the power of film. Right. You know, you are an activist, and you're also a teacher, mm -hmm. and you're encouraging your te your students to take on projects as activists. And this is such a stellar example. You are in a very special position to do this. But I mean, I take it that our audience was very affected by what. Oh, well, you're a seen. hero. You're a hero. <laughs> Thank you. And it's so nice to have someone see the movie because you're the first ones to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just really great to get the feedback, and because me and my editor, we basically just are in a little room, and um, and so it's just nice to, to and, and you know, of course, we we think we we have ca captured the story and captured the you know the, the humanity of the people there, but it's just nice to to get feedback from you. So thank you. That's really waiting to get a question. Oh no, no. <laughs> we can't. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, not sorry. It's not. It's a little tangential, but I I was just amazed by you telling the story of sneaking or sneaking the footage, getting in, um, and it's not directly related to to um, the cause or the of the core of the movie. But I was just really curious. You talked about your roommate, who is the older woman, and who is just exploring the world, and then the ten of you on the bus. Like, did you did you guys find out, or did you find out why some of those other people? What made them want to 
tour North Korea and then did any of them know your real reason? Yeah, that's it. That was because when we first all met, we were all strangers, right? Um, the Johnny and his friend Alex, they were both from Australia. They knew each other. But everybody else pretty much were kind of strangers. So, you know, we're just kind of tooling along, you know, taking the, the sleeper train down to, you know, down to the border. And so we got really close. And everybody were, were really great travelers. They, everybody had been pretty much uh, seasoned travelers, almost everybody. And so nobody complained. They were just an amazing group to travel with. And we got really sick towards the end. Um, half, uh, like more than half the group got food poisoning, and everybody was just super ill. And everybody was still amazing. Mm. And so it was funny. The last day, we had all gotten really close. And when we were taking the, when we left the country, then everybody was like, we were exchanging emails, and then everybody started fessing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one guy, Martin, I got some of his, uh, his stills. Martin is a journalist for in, in Germany, and I was a filmmaker. <laughs> and, yeah, so everybody started fessing up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <It's my> <laughs> and they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, I just have a quick follow-up to that. Is sure. Well, I mean, I don't know. No, I was going to say, it's yeah. just, it just makes me think, like, North Korea... I feel like they should know, like, these people who, like, are taking the tours, like, who really wants to tour North Korea, you know? Like, do they not know that these are people that are all trying to sneak footage or something? It's crazy to me. Yeah, yeah, because that's, like, why we were, uh, that this area of the country we were in, um, I interviewed Tim Peters. He works with um, people who have crossed, the, particularly women, because uh, 85 percent of North Korean women who escaped the country and in China are sold into sex labor. Mm. So well, either by being married off to Chinese men, because in this region particularly there's a shortage of women, or just into prostitution. So I mean that's huge. And so the children from from these marriages, and sometimes the women will agree to be to, to be to a arranged marriage just to get them to a safe place out of Korea, North Korea. And but what happens is if they are caught and repatriated back to North Korea. If they've had children with that, uh, with that Chinese man, the children are kind of persona non grata. They're not North Koreans, and China doesn't really recognize them as Chinese, and so they can't they can't get an identity card. So um, because you have to like say who both parents are, so you can't say who the mother is. So they it's, it's a huge issue. So what Tim has done is he's taking these children. Uh, these orphans, because then sometimes the men just turn the kids out because either they can't afford them or they're not interested anymore or they just, or something happens to the father. And so he takes the children in, which is illegal in China, um, and he kind of puts them in make, into foster homes, kind of these in, cre foster homes created you know, by them. And, and, and then they just start either, they either try and give them an uh, identity card legally or they will get one that's forged. And he's a minister, and he said, you know what, my whole job, he says, I don't want a church, I don't want any of these. He said, my job is in Africa, and it's to protect these children. And so, um, so you know, all of this stuff is like happening along the border that is just really um, kind of kind of horrific. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I lost my train of thought that quick. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, but, but Tim uh, has, has just been this really amazing figure and uh, about what's kind of what's going on on the border. And, and, um, and if he has an underground railroad, and they call it the Underground Railroad there. Uh, and they have completely modeled it after the American system. And so that was another thing that was just really stunning, um, that they basically do have an underground railroad coming out of North Korea. And you go through China, and sometimes you go through Thailand, sometimes you go through Mongolia, sometimes you go, but you, everybody's trying to get to South Korea because you get automatic citizenship once you get to New South Korea. Wow. We have time for two more questions from people we haven't heard from. Yes. I, I, I just like to make a comment. Like as a person who grew up in the Soviet Union, it took us eight years also to get out of there. For me, it, this, there isn't much surprise because basically the cult of the Kim's family, dictatorship, everything was copied. Even insignia of North Korean military is almost the exact copy of the Soviet army. So I, I can only tell you everything, what you, what you told in some way relates to uh, to what we knew about the Soviet Union, about the Stalin, about everything. I can only tell you, you did the great thing. Uh, 
And good thing you didn't know, you didn't realize all the risks you were mm. taking. Probably mm. you did. Otherwise, you would never probably do it. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. go back to the country now. Yeah. It's true. Okay. I wouldn't go back, yeah. Because it is, if I had been caught with that footage, mm -hmm. like they, mm -hmm. the, the guy who they just released recently, yes. they had held him for six mm -hmm. months. Yeah, he Bible left a, a Bible, right. Korean, uh, America, a Korean English Bible in the bathroom of the Siemens Club. We were there. We were, it was in Changjin, in the Siemens Club. And, um, and those people are, it, it, there's a patriotism that is out of, you know, of, of, of loyalty to the country, but also a fear of, you know, potentially what could happen. That he had left that Bible in that, that bathroom. I was like, oh dear God, you've lost your mind. And because not only did he put himself at risk, he put his entire tour, tour group at risk. Yeah. And fortunately, the tour group, because they detained everybody for, I guess, uh, at least a day, and they finally let the tour group go when they realized it was him. But they, but he was he was there six months, yeah. Um, I was going to say, you know, uh, I don't know, if, I guess, since you're a seasoned traveler, you may have already been to Thailand and the Philippines, but if you go there, you also, it, it's anyone, anyone, if you, if you say anything bad about uh, the president, either, either of Thailand or of the uh, of Philippines, you can be incarcerated. And they'll throw you the key. So, I mean, it's not something they, they advertise because they want people to go. They want tourists to go. But it's, it's still, there's this undercurrent of uh, you always have to be careful. I mean, always. And uh, I mean, I've been to the Philippines very many times. And <laughs> the first thing you see when you arrive in the airport, it says, death to drug dealers. It's a huge sign. And it's in English. And most people don't speak English there. It's a lie. You know, most Filipinos are they, they keep them ignorant, so they don't speak English. But everything is in English. So, but you know, if you if you say, and the funny thing is, you go to Thailand and you go to see where the president lives, it's uh, the entire uh, all the buildings are covered in gold. So it's really bizarre. I mean, uh, uh, this is immense <coughs> poverty, and the palatial home is covered in gold. Literally. Yeah, and that's the, the Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il statues. I mean, these things are everywhere. I mean, you just drive along a country road and you just see like this massive mosaic <laughs> of uh, like they had a mosaic. It literally is probably like the size of this wall from like you know there to there, and it's little itty bitty tiles that they have done this massive mm -hmm. thing in, and it's just in the middle of the country on, on a road. <laughs> and it's like, and then there's no electricity in this area. It's hard to get electricity. That sign is lit up at night. <laughs> and I'm sure it's not the only one. So. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, and so, yeah, exactly. So you see all of this insane, these insane bronzes, mm -hmm. and then this immense poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah. We could, we probably should, and we will devote an entire evening and revisit your work if we can. Would love to, would love to. But thank you, and please everybody go to the oh, website. Oh, I, because I'm, we're running out. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go, yes. Well, well, I was actually, I wanted to ask you about the, the North the Korean defector woman that we interviewed uh, that was speaking. Yeah. I mean, I'm just curious from a sort of, from a, I mean, I know this is a work in progress, but in the final, are you going to have her, will she be speaking or will the translator's voice and will be subtitled? Uh, we're working that out now because. I mean, I mean this is my yeah. personal bias, so I'm going to say it because I, think, because I feel very strongly about it. Yeah. There's something. Disempowering about someone not to be able to speak in their own voice. Right. And I feel, I was like, oh, it made me cringe when I was watching it because I really want to hear her. And if I have to read it, that's fine because it, I'm, I'm empowered by mm -hmm. the, the trivial that she's gone through. Right. And, and that was the, me and that my editor talked about that because when she is speaking, she is so emotional. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the translator, it's just very yeah. cut and dry. Yeah. And she sounds much younger, which is a weird disconnect. Which, it, yeah, yeah. So this was, um, so yeah, we're, we're going to, because I, I think so too. I think that it's important to hear her, even if we, because um, what I'm thinking about doing actually is having a voiceover artist do her voice. And like you'll hear her underneath, and then you'll have someone um, that is like closer to her age, and, to, and that is emoting like she's emoting it. Um, but yeah, for, for, for what we could do on short notice, that's what we had to do. But, but I, I think you're right, because we were troubled by that too, because it's just this very flat, non-emotive, and she was saying some pretty horrific things. I mean, she, it was eight of them that went in, and um, her and her son and daughter were the only ones that came out. <laughs>
So please do stay on our website, and you know uh, uh, there will be a link where you can um, you know get emails and e-blast, and um, and even if you just want to go to the Indiegogo site and just you know just get on the, the mailing list, you know please do, and uh, we'd love to you know stay in touch with you, and, and thank you so much. Really appreciate thank you. That.